So the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and it, it's the way that, of course, Oliver North, William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country, and many connections between the two. This SNL that, that Benson bought after he got out of Jefferson, uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. A subject that has been ignored by the establishment media. Pete Bruton has written a book about it, and we talk with him right now on Alternative Views. Today, Alternative Views will interview Pete Bruton concerning his book, The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. Pete is a former Houston Post reporter who broke the story of the connections between the SNL scandal and the CIA, exposing how CIA assets would borrow money from the SNLs to finance off-the-book operations and then declare bankruptcy and leave U.S. taxpayers with the bill. Well, for the past five years, Pete has been tracking down who actually profited from the SNL scam, who the main players were, and how they skimmed off their money. Lo and behold, Pete discovered that the beneficiaries of the SNL scandals were friends of George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer. Well, obviously, this is an explosive story, and today we are going to explore the full ramifications of the SNL crisis with author Pete Bruton, who's now a law student here at the University of Texas. Pete, this is such an incredible story, one that is so complex, it seems to me almost one impossible to tell, but you do it so well in your book. Uh, before we get into the intricacies of it, I wonder if you can tell us uh, how George Bush himself was involved in this. His family was, but was he himself involved much? Bush's role was on many levels. First of all, as vice president during the Reagan-Bush years, he was the head of the Reagan-Bush deregulation efforts across the board, and that included savings and loans. And the deregulation of savings and loans that occurred primarily in 1982 with the uh, St. Germain Garn bill um, basically opened up savings and loans to the crooks. Uh, SNLs had traditionally just done home mortgage lending uh, to middle class Americans and they succeeded very well for 50 years. Uh, they had some problems then in the late 70s and early 80s with the inflation, so the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia 
was one of the first people, uh, groups, involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. Uh, Bush also, as vice president, either he or his top aides intervened in the federal regulation of the biggest failed savings loan in the country at that time, Sunrise Savings in Boynton Beach, Florida. The CEO of Sunrise went out to Bush's office when he was vice president, and the, the story varies. He tells one story one time and one story another. He either met with Bush, with Bush's top aides, including C. Boyd and Gray, who is the current White House counsel. Uh, and he asked them to get the federal regulators off his back. They were trying to stop Sunrise from basically throwing their assets away. And uh, one week after he met with these people, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board that regulates savings and loans withdrew a very stringent cease and desist order against Sunrise and replaced it with a weak supervisory agreement. And a congressional study found that this move cost taxpayers possibly $100 million or more in keeping Sunrise open. Sunrise was then closed down a year later, a year and a half later, uh, at a cost to the federal taxpayers of $700 million. And there was no Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation. It was just shut down. Uh, we find if you look at the major borrowers at Sunrise, you find mafia people, you find CIA people, and you find a Houston businessman named John Riddle, who ties into the circle of Houston businessmen that George Bush comes from. And Riddle, at this time, was involved in the transshipment of arms to the Middle East. Now, the top number two official at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and Fairbanks was in this meeting with the Sunrise CEO when he was asking them to get the feds off his back. Her husband, Richard Fairbanks was in charge at that time of the State Department's efforts to keep arms from Iran called Operation Staunch. He quit a year later and became the Washington lawyer and lobbyist for Iraq and worked with Iraq until Iraq <laughs> invaded Kuwait. Now it's interesting also to note that the largest failed SNL in the country that did not have a Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation, Sunrise was number two largest. The largest was Hill Financial in Red Hill, Pennsylvania that plays a big part in my book. And the number two borrower at Hill Financial was John Riddle's buddy, a Houston builder named Mike Adkinson, who at that time was transshipping arms to the Middle East. So you find a connecting thread here of arms to the Middle East and savings and loans. And, and Bush's office was directly involved in keeping this Sunrise, uh, sunrise Savings open and was lending money to John Riddle. It seems like such a, a complex thing, but it seems everywhere you look, there are certain things going on. The CIA and the Mafia, and uh, there were drugs that were being run back uh, into the United States. There were illegal arms being uh, procured and sent to uh, the Contras, as well as to Iran. And Iraq, as we now know. And Iraq. Uh, but all of these interests coincided, the Mafia, the, uh, now, how did the mafia, was the mafia just after money? Is that how, and, uh, and uh, perhaps the selling of drugs when they came back into the United States? I think the mafia just found it as another, you know, trough they could feed at. And I think they were in on it at the beginning when they saw, they knew what deregulation was going to do. And the fact that they, they figured out a scheme, and, and the head of this scheme was a New York mobster named Mario Renda, mm -hmm. who went to jail for like, less than three years. Uh, he was convicted in New York, Florida, and Kansas City. Uh, Renda would collect money from various institutions like pension funds and credit unions, bundle it up into $100,000 bundles so it was covered by federal deposit insurance, and then place it in savings and loans all across the country, billions of dollars. And once he got the money, the deposits into an SNL, he could basically control them. He, could, he had a hammer over their head if they didn't do with this money what he wanted to, he'd just pull it out. And this was called linked financing. He would place the deposits and then tell the SNLs to loan the money, to lend the money to his buddies. They would then just rip it off, take it and, and, and rip it off. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country.
many connections between the two. But BV would actually finance the purchase of savings and loans by his associates like Don Dixon at Vernon, Carol Kelly at Continental, uh, Jarrett Woods at Western, Roy Daly at First Savings of East Texas. And then he would have a hammer over their head where he was holding the note on their stock to the SNL so they would do what he wanted to. I think it's so significant what you've pointed out that this isn't just something, the, these relationships aren't something which came together suddenly when they said, oh, hey, here's a great big uh, pig, let's cut it up. There were, this was just a continuation of relationships between powerful people uh, at various levels, uh, state, local, and national, that have been going on for some time. Well, that, that's correct. In fact, we had a sort of dry run on the SNL scandal in the mid-70s in Texas with the so-called Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal, where we have the same people that showed up in the SNL crisis ripping off small Texas banks and doing the same thing, trading bad loans between each other, uh, trading co capital stock loans between each other. And uh, Herman K. Beebe was in the middle of that. Uh, ben Barnes, his, his uh, business partner, was in the middle of it. And then later, Ben Barnes and John Conley show up as big, big borrowers at many of the dirtiest SNLs in the country. Uh, George Alban, another uh, guy that was involved in savings and loans, uh, was in the Texas rent bank scandal. So, and, and the federal government knew about the rent bank scandal. They came in and, and did an investigation. Uh, there was a savings and loan in Texas, in Houston, called Surety, that a woman named Rosemary Stewart was in charge of, of the federal regulation of in Washington. And she saw Herman K.B., she saw Walter Misher, she saw Misher's son-in-law, Robert Corson. And when these people all got back in the SNLs, you know, five, ten years later, she did nothing. And she was then in charge of the Office of Enforcement of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Yeah, your book begins, in fact, by discussing Walter Misher, who is a Houston banker and power broker, as a major player in this whole SNL scam. Can you tell a little bit about him and what role he actually played in this scenario? Yeah, Walter Misher um, was at the very center of the Houston business connections that that all you, you take all these SNLs and you start tracking back where the money goes and you find Misher and his friends. Misher was what we call a hyphenated Texan, banker hyphenated <laughs> developer. And there's probably a few other hyphens in there too, uh, political power broker. Um, he controlled politicians on all levels. Um, Misher basically told the Houston developers who they were going to donate political campaign, uh, campaign money to. Um, Misher had the third largest bank in Houston, Allied Bank, and he used Allied Bank to finance many different things, including some of the dirtiest savings and loans in Houston, like Continental Savings, uh, Mainland Savings, uh, and some others. And in fact, Misher knew that the SNLs were going down the tubes in the early 80s because he sold a savings and loan he had, Ben Franklin Savings, that at one time had belonged to Lloyd Benson's company. Uh, he also ordered all the SNL capital stock loans out of, of Allied uh, in 82, 83, so that when these SNLs failed, he wouldn't be caught holding the bag. And in turn, he had many savings and loans helping he and his bank out indirectly. In one time, Mainland Savings in Houston bought a $20 million loan that Allied held on an oil company it was in bankruptcy. And a later investigation showed that Mainland lost at least $14 million on this. There was no hope of repaying, and Mainland just did it as a favor to Allied. The CEO of, of Mainland had had his Mainland stock financed at Allied Bank and was a good friend of Walter Misher. And, and what sort of political friends did Walter Misher have? Who were his main sort of political connections? Well, Misher goes back to the old 8F days of the Lamar Hotel in Houston where the Brown brothers, uh, Jesse Jones, Gus Wortham, these people were wheeling and dealing, controlling Houston and, and, and politicians like Lyndon Johnson. It goes back that far. And then you bring uh, uh, Misher, was very close to John Conley, Ben Barnes, uh, Lloyd Benson, and George Bush. And uh, most of the Houston mayors and Harris County judges um, almost all of the Texas governors, except for Ann Richards, I'm not sure about her, but 
We know uh, Dolph Briscoe and, and uh, even uh, Republicans like Bill Clements, uh, Mishra was very close to and supported. And Mishra's political donations and influence went to both parties. It was not just Democrats. I mean, he, he supported Democrats, of course, back in the 50s and 60s when Democrats controlled the state. But he also, you know, controlled and, and helped a lot of, of Republicans like John Tower and, uh, and George Bush and Bill Clinton. So he was a well-connected uh, fellow. Very well connected, and, and not just, of course, the politicians. I mean, he was connected to the mafia, well, that's which was a big shock. I mean, when, when uh, I was reporting the Houston Post, and people started telling me about his connections to the mafia, and uh, we did a big interview with him, and it was on the cover of the Houston Post Sunny Magazine. And uh, I asked him, what about all the rumors about your connections to Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans mafia boss? And he admitted that he had sat down to do business with Marcello. At one time, Marcello had come in and wanted to buy a couple of his hotels, including the Carousel Hotel on the South Loop. And he said he did not sell them to him because he did not want to get, quote, run out of town. Well, it turns out <laughs> when you investigate who he really sold it to, it turns out to be a Marcello frontman and associate. So he really did, and, and Misher and his partners kept the deed, the title, to this hotel while Marcello's front man was showing the X-rated movies and running prostitutes in this hotel. And what about uh, H.K. Beebe, his connections with Walter Misher and the uh, mob? Yeah, well, well Beebe, the, New Orleans, uh, the Louisiana Mafia associate from Shreveport, um, had turned up first in the Texas Renabank scandal where he was connected to Ben Barnes, who, of course, was in Walter Misher's hip pocket. Um, Beebe then uh, was borrowing money from Misher's allied bank. Uh, Misher was supporting him, making him uh, operating loans, uh, giving him insurance business. And in one case, uh, uh, the stock of Continental Savings in Houston was financed at Misher's allied bank with a guarantee from Herman K. Beebe. So they were very close in doing business, not only in the Tex Houston area, but in Louisiana. We find associates of Misher, very close associates, including the former controller of the currency, Robert Clark, going in and buying a bank with Herman K. Beebe in Louisiana, along with two, the two top executives at Misher's bank. Now, was he, uh, was Beebe uh, under Marcello? Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And this had been determined actually by the Texas Attorney General's Organized Crime Strike Force in the mid-70s. Uh, John Hill has actually had an organized crime investigative unit uh, headed by, I believe, Tim James. And they found the connections between uh, Herman K. Beebe and Carlos Marcello. Uh, Beebe was also tied to Marcello by the New Orleans Metropolitan Crime Commission. This is back in the mid-70s, and then you find all of the connections then later with the SNL scandal. Can you give us an example of how the mafia comes in with the mob, uh, loots a uh, savings and loan or two, and then move on? Well, they would, uh, in Beebe's case, he would actually finance the, the controlling stock of an SNL, and then the loans would be made to either BB or his associates, and then they would take the money and walk the loans, and uh, leaving the SNL with property that wasn't worth any what, matter what they'd lent on it. And that's the way they'd basically fail. How did the CIA get involved then with these people? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I don't think we know the final answer yet. Um, there are some people that believe that William Casey had been in on the beginning of the deregulation and knew that it was susceptible. You know, Casey was an old Wall Street lawyer and head of the SEC at one time and knew that the, the SNLs were very vulnerable to being looted and the money taken out and, and never found. Uh, but on the other hand, we have people like Walter Misher uh, who are connected to the CIA can probably see that if they keep the CIA happy, you know, diverting some of the money to CIA operations, then, you know, they will get what the FBI calls the CIA's get out of jail free card. In other words, if they're working, doing, and helping the CIA and they get caught, then the CIA can come in and say, don't prosecute this person. Uh, he's working with us. And that happened on a number of occasions in the SNL crisis, where we would have a, a, a savings and loan looter uh, 
or a bank looter getting caught by the FBI and the Justice Department, the CIA trying to get them off the hook because they work with them. Now, we've had on Alternative Views, those of you who've been watching Alternative Views regularly know that about the uh, drug scams which were going on where illegal arms would be shipped down to the Contras particularly and the C-130s would be filled up with uh, cocaine and all and brought back in the United States and offloaded, sometimes at U.S. Um, Air Force bases, sometimes at uh, uh, more covert landing strips. Uh, now, how would this operation fit in with what we're talking about? Right. Uh, we found a number of people in Florida that were helping the Contras, taking weapons, guns for drugs, that were involved in failed banks and savings and loans. Um, one CIA gun and drug runner was a guy named Jack DeVoe. And DeVoe was actually bringing in his cocaine into the Ocean Reef Club on Key Largo that was owned by Carl Linder. The Cincinnati uh, businessman. Oh, and he's very uh, close to Bush. Very close to Bush. Okay, Bush would go down and actually vacation at the Ocean Reef Club. And there's a picture in my book of Bush in a fishing boat off Ocean Reef. And this is where Jack DeVoe was bringing in his cocaine. And DeVoe was also taking guns down to Latin America for the CIA. Now, DeVoe's money launderer was a Miami attorney named Lawrence Freeman. Freeman had previously worked for Paul Hellowell, one of the founding fathers of the CIA, and also was laundering money for Santo Traficante, the Tampa, Florida uh, mafia boss. Freeman drew up the documents, the sales contract for a 21,000 acre land deal in the Florida Panhandle that Hill Financial Savings, the one in Pennsylvania we previously talked about, and Vision Bank Savings in Kingsville, Texas, that was owned by Walter Mischer's former son-in-law, financed. And here we have Lawrence Freeman uh, drawing up the papers and involved with these people. And he's, you know, closely connected to the CIA. He had been the in-house counsel for Castle Bank and Trust in Nassau, uh, a bank that was used by the mafia and the CIA to hide and launder money and was shut down when Paul Hellowell died. And it appeared that many of these, these offshore money laundering operations were moved after Castle Bank failed and, and was shut down to the Isle of Jersey. And Lawrence Freeman was laundering Jack DeVoe's drug money through the Isle of Jersey. Uh, Robert Corson, uh, Mishra's former son-in-law, and Mike Atkinson were laundering SNL money through the Isle of Jersey, along with some people in Colorado that connect to Neil Bush. All were using the same, the same trust. The same trust on the Isle of Jersey were getting drug money and SNL money, and they were mixed in in the same bank accounts. Um, Pete, could you give us some examples of how the CIA would loot SNLs and what they'd use the money for? Well, it, it's not like the CIA would you'd, you'd get a loan from an SNL and, <laughs> and, and down the bottom line, you know, for guns, guns to uh, the Contras. Signed by the CIA. Right. right. Uh, that's not the way they operate. I mean, they use cutouts and front people so that to maintain their plausible deniability so that they can come in and deny that it wasn't them. And what's a cutout then? A cutout is a front man, a middle person, who may not even know he's working for the CIA. Mm -hmm. I think there could be four or five levels of, of cutouts and front men, the, the layers that the CIA, would, the money would flow through so that it couldn't be tracked back to the CIA. Um, one of the best examples we have in the SNLs was when Mainland Savings, this is the SNL that Walter Mischer was financing the stock of, this is the SNL whose, whose chairman of the board, Raymond Hill, was a close and longtime friend of James A. Baker III, White House Chief of Staff, former Treasury Secretary, former Secretary of State, George Bush's best friend. Uh, when Mainland failed, James Baker's old law firm, Andrews and Kurth in Houston, was brought in by the feds to investigate the failure and file a lawsuit against the officers and directors to try to recover the lost money. Andrews and Kurth investigated actually drew up a lawsuit, a petition, but was never filed. It was stopped at the top layers of Andrews Kurth and the federal government. And as a result, no lawsuit was ever filed against Raymond Hill, the, the, the mainland CEO, and no money was ever recovered. Uh, no indictments have ever been filed against anybody in the failure of mainland savings. Okay, so here we have this SNL. It's wired in to Walter Mischer and James Baker. Uh, in the summer of 1985, 
James Baker went before a Senate Finance Committee as Treasury Secretary and told them that there was nothing to worry about in the SNLs. Everything was wonderful and fine <laughs> and nothing bad was going to happen. At the very same time, Mainland Savings was entering into a $68 million land deal with Adnan Khashoggi, a oh. Saudi Arabian middleman yeah. and arms dealer. And uh, it was a very complicated deal. The result of it was that Khashoggi walked away with about $16 million in cash profit, pure profit from this land deal. Uh, the taxpayers later got stuck with about a $50 million loss on this deal. This was closed. This deal was closed and the money transferred on August the 1st, 1985. Six days later, Adnan Khashoggi begins the transfer of $5 million to Gobanifar, the Iranian middleman, to start the first publicized arms for hostages deal. It's interesting that he transferred $5 million to Gobanifar because at the same time, Mainland was basically giving him $16 million. They also gave him a $5 million letter of credit that was very strange because it could only be drawn on in the first week in November of 85. And it had all the earmarks of a guarantee. And in fact, Later, when Khashoggi's people were trying to cover this up from the FBI, who, who caught on to this pretty soon, uh, they said it was a, to guarantee uh, some stock that Khashoggi had bought from Mainland. But the money to buy that stock had come from Mainland in this deal. In other words, Mainland gave Khashoggi $10 million. He gives it back to them in exchange for $10 million in stock. And they said, oh, by the way, here's a letter of credit for $5 million to guarantee this stock. It didn't make any sense at all because it came from mainland. The money came from mainland, but the $5 million matches exactly the $5 million that Khashoggi paid Gabbana for. So, Pete, this is, in a sense, the beginning of Iran-Contra. Yes. That's funded with SNL money. So and one ultimately. of the reasons why Baker and Bush and the U.S. government was not regulating the SNLs, was not doing something about this crisis that was emerging, is because they were using the SNLs to finance some of their off-the-book activities they didn't want Congress or the public to look into. I think, Is that a correct? Thing? I think that's ultimately what happened. Now, whether we can prove that they, quote, used them, uh, you know, we'll probably never know, but that is the ultimate upshot of what happened. And the money, of course, from mainland ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and, it, and it's the way that, of course, Oliver North and William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. I mean, North testified before Congress that what William Casey was looking for and trying to set up was a self-sustaining, off-the-shelf, self-financing covert operation. And here we had it. Uh, we see it in operation with the savings and loan money that ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So, you know, Khashoggi wasn't out any money. Uh, the Iranians and Israelis really weren't out. It came from the American taxpayers. Incredible. Now, in the, so much of what we've talked about previously in alternative views and in a lot of the news stories that you would read, they would mainly focus on the savings and loans themselves and all these wheelers and dealers like Don Dixon up in Vernon Savings or Charles Keating and all of that. But we're talking about a stratum above that, those people, aren't we? Oh, definitely. I think Dixon and Keating and, and all the others, Ed McBurney, Jarrett Woods, Tyrell Barker, were just front men. I mean, they were cutouts, basically. And if you look at how much money they got, I call them one or two percenters. Uh, Dixon got maybe, what, $20 million out of Vernon? I mean, he himself. And Vernon is costing taxpayers over $1 billion. Keating got about $40 million. And Lincoln Savings is costing taxpayers two billion dollars. So you can see you're getting one or two percent and, and it's a classic front man setup. And uh, the people that you have to, who's really getting this money and you start scratching and digging you find that you, you're in another stratum as you say of businessmen who are connected to the politicians very strongly. Of course Keating had strong connections too but if you look at who got the money out of, out of Lincoln you find uh, John Conley and Ben Barnes getting close to a hundred million dollars. Uh, you find a little bank in Paris called Saudi European. Paris, Texas. Paris, 
Oh, no, actually Paris, France. Paris, France? Yes. Oh. It, it connects into the BCCI. Oh, I see. And uh, Keating was investing money in, in that. Um, and you start scratching and digging, and you find even bigger players than Keating behind this. So then there, that, now this layer is the layer of the Mafia and the CIA. And uh, was anybody, was there another layer above them, like the big banks? Uh, they must, they were getting the money, uh, the benefits of the l money laundering from drugs because they would uh, be laundered through the uh, U.S. big banking system. Well, that's correct. Were they also benefiting from this at a, even a, a yes. same level or higher level? Well, the banks and insurance companies, believe it or not, were some of the, the big institutions that got bailed out by the SNLs. If you had a piece of property or an office building, the, the first mortgage or the first lien on it might be held by a big bank or a big insurance company. And when the savings and loan would come in and take out everything and refinance the whole deal, the banks and SNLs would get paid off by the savings and loan. In fact, that happened in the Khashoggi deal. Uh, Texas Commerce Bank had a $15 million a mortgage against Khashoggi's property. And the money to pay off that mortgage came from mainland savings and also Lamar Savings in Austin uh, joined in, in in that. So Texas Commerce Bank got all their money back from the savings and loans. You find it happening time and time again. A piece of property will have a first big first mortgage by a bank or insurance company that will get paid off by the SNL when they take the whole deal out. Well, as I understand the big banks, I mean the Wall Street banks and all, a lot of these deals, a lot of the property would be resold and eventually uh, they would come up into the hands of these bigger banks and insurance companies like in New York. And so I guess they would be the first ones to be paid off in any type of bailout, would they not? Well, sure. I mean, if they're holding the first mortgage, mm -hmm. they get, they're going to get the money first before anybody. And the savings loan might be holding a third or fourth mortgage. I mean, they would wrap these things and flip these things so that the SNL might be third or fourth in line and would never get, once the property sold uh, and the first mortgage, uh, mortgagee is paid off, the SNL is left with nothing. Pete, there's a chapter of your book called The Mobsters, Spooks, and George Bush, The Palmer National Bank Story, that ties all these things that we're talking about together. In other words, the way that high-level officials with connections to the government, corporate and political officials, formed a bank, the Palmer National Bank, and how it became connected with all these unsavory operations. Do you want to give us some detail on this to sort of concretely illustrate this analysis? The yeah, Palmer National Bank had just about everybody in it. It was a small bank, still exists in Washington, D.C., about two blocks north of the White House. Uh, it was started by a Louisiana businessman named Harvey McLean and a, a political operative in Washington, D.C. called Stephen Halper. And McLean and Halper met in 1980 when they were both working on George Bush's presidential campaign. And uh, Halper later was, was head of the policy uh, group for Bush. And then when Reagan uh, became the nominee and, and Bush was named vice, pre uh, vice presidential candidate, Halper went to work for their campaign as and, and part of the policy group and was actually uh, a high-level official in what they called the October Surprise Group the group that was trying to determine whether or not Carter was going to pull off an October surprise and get the Iranian hostages home or whatever. My, and Halper was, was uh, in charge of this group. His father-in-law was Ray Klein, who was the former deputy director of intelligence of the CIA. Klein was working with them, with Bush. And then when, when Reagan and Bush won, uh, Halper went to work for the State Department. They created a position for him. And James Baker, by the way, was the one that brought Halper over to the Reagan-Bush team after Reagan became the nominee from, from the Bush team. So, and Harvey McLean was a businessman from Shreveport, Louisiana, and he was being financed by none other than Herman K. Beebe, the Mafia associate. McLean <laughs> moves to Dallas and buys Paris Savings Loan in Paris, Texas and is borrowing money from Vernon Savings, from Continental Savings in Houston. And uh, later, of course, all these loans go bad and Paris goes bust. And McLean's business deals cost taxpayers probably over $100 million. That's kind of getting ahead of the story. Back in 83, McLean and Halper are taking a trip to China and they start talking about, let's get a bank in Washington, D.C. And so they, they start Palmer National Bank. 
Palmer was named after uh, McLean's grandmother and daughter. And the capital, the $3 million capital to start the bank came from Herman K. Beebe and Bozier a bank and trust. The Beebe's guy bank. connected to the mob in Louisiana. Right, right. He and, seemed, he and to, to be everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> and to Misher, and to Ben Barnes, John Connolly, uh, all these people. Um, so when, as soon as they start this bank, they begin lending money to conservative Republican PACs like uh, Bob Dole and uh, Jack Kemp. And then they take on another client, the National Endowment for the Preservation of Liberty, which was started by Oliver North and a guy named Spitz Channel to funnel private donations to the Contras. Okay, and of course the biggest donor was Ellen Garwood uh, here in, in Austin, the widow of the former Supreme Court Justice. Um, and Palmer National Bank was also lending money to uh, the National Endowment uh, for operating loans and for furniture loans and helping funnel the money. That's where they had the, the bank. Would, the money would go from Palmer National Bank to uh, another Washington bank to the Cayman Islands and then over to Geneva, Switzerland um, in, in the bank account uh, at, at Credit Suisse where um, not only was Contra money being flowed into, but Iranian arms profits were also Secord being... Secord was operating yes, that. Was, that. that was Secord's. And then, then it would go out to the Contras. And Palmer was the, was the starting point of the money. And uh, Palmer National Bank also made a, a loan on a, uh, a beach house in Solano Beach, California, that B.B. and Dixon uh, would use to entertain uh, SNL regulators, <laughs> including L.L. Uh, L. Bowman. Uh, in fact, they may, that's where he allegedly uh, uh, had a tryst with a prostitute uh, in that beach house. And Palmer National Bank had a piece of the action on, on that uh, beach house. And uh, later, Stephen Halper was, when he got caught in the debate gate scandal, if you call that uh, the, the, the theft of the Carter debating uh, manuals that ended up in the Reagan Bush campaign that apparently uh, James Baker or William Casey or both of them were involved in. And that was just part of an enormous covert action against right. the Carter administration, which they had something like 137 operatives at all kinds of high levels, uh, spying, snooping, and even stealing top secret documents. And this is just one of their right. uh, well, Hal operations. Yeah, that's correct. Well, Halper was involved in that. And he, of course, his name surfaced in 1984 when this came out, and he had to sort of leave. He kind of backed out of Palmer National Bank. Uh, but he stayed in touch with these people, of course. And then when Oliver North was fired by Reagan in November 1986, when the, when the scheme where they were, you know, using profits from the Iranian uh, arms deals to fund the Contras, and it all came tumbling out, and Reagan fired North, the very last entry in Oliver North's White House diaries was legal defense firm dash Stephen Halper, our old Palmer National Bank guy. Who also, again, I want to make this October Surprise connection because uh, Halper was the head of the October Surprise Committee for the uh, Reagan election team in 1980, which was frightened to death that the Carter administration was going to negotiate the release of the hostages, which may be one of the reasons why they stole the debate book, as well as did these other covert actions against Carter, because they wanted to find out what he was doing for this hostage release, and if possible, subvert it and give the Iranians a better deal. At least that's the account that Gary Sick and others give. That's correct. And which was in the middle of it. And how it worked out that way. They rigged a deal so that uh, the Iranians would hold the hostages until after the election and in return for arms. And lo and behold, uh, 20 minutes after Reagan raised his hand and said that he would ruin the country, the, uh, uh, the hostages were released. Well, and, and here we have this little bank, you know, that was involved in all this being financed with Louisiana Mafia money. And uh, when Herman K. Beebe was convicted, first convicted in 1985, of course, they moved that loan out of Bozier Bank to a little savings and loan in Beaumont, Texas, called uh, San Jacinto Savings, different from San Jacinto in Houston. And if you look at the, the board members of that bank, you find uh, two people who were uh, major stockholders in the casinos, uh, Caesars, uh, casino in Las Vegas that, of course, was, was being uh, skimmed by the Chicago Mafia.
at that time. So it's absolutely incredible how all this is connected. October Surprise, Iran-Contra, SNL, Mafia, CIA, all of this, William Casey, all of these operations under the Reagan administration were interconnected as well as the players. And then you find the same people and the same threads running through uh, these, these operations and, and the money you know, from SNLs going into these operations. Wow. Can you tell us another story about a landing strip in Lajitas, Texas? Uh, yes. Um, I first found out about uh, the possible connections to the savings and loans and the CIA in, I guess, the fall of 1988 when a woman in Houston called up uh, my associate at the Houston Post, Greg C., and uh, told him, berated him about uh, some of our coverage of SNLs that weren't getting the whole story. So we went to see her. Uh, her name was Rebecca Sims. She had been Robert Corson, uh, Mishra's former son-in-law, his accountant. And uh, she had quit because she'd been asked to commit bankruptcy and tax fraud. And so she started investigating Corson. And she found out that Corson had been an uh, asset of the CIA. And um, when she first told me that, uh, I, I really wasn't interested in it at all. Um, I had no interest in it. I wasn't looking for the CIA. I was looking for the Mafia. And I guess I was even a little disappointed. But when I went back to my office, I, I remembered several things. One, when we had done the story on Walter Misher and had been calling everybody all his people he knew just to get background information on him. Uh, one of his close associates told me about the, the 700,000 acres in Belize in Central America that he had bought into and that, that his associate thought that this was a CIA operation. And this was someone who's very close to Misher and pr would not say something like that unless he knew it would, had something to do. And I sort of filed that, you know, away in my mind. I remembered that came up and then I remember there was a organized crime strike force prosecutor in Kansas City that was chasing Mario Renda, the New York mob money broker. And uh, I had been, I was chasing Renda too, so we had a lot of contact. And I'd been sending him our stories we'd been writing in the Houston Post. And he said almost the same thing Rebecca Sims had said, you're missing something big here, there's something you're not getting. And so I wondered if he was talking about the CIA. So I, I flew up to Kansas City and and I met with him, and sure enough, that was it. He was talking about the CIA. So that's how the CIA connection arose. And, and uh, Rebecca Sims had been told about the CIA connection from a man named Richard Brennicky. Oh, um, my gosh. He's, his name pops up in October all kinds surprise, of... October Surprise, Iran, Contra, yeah. Contra, yeah. Contra uh, Drugs. Drugs. Brennicky <laughs> uh, had been the sort of renegade intelligence agent in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, he had received a lot of notoriety because he had, some of the breaking stories on Iran-Contra had come from him on the Iranian arms deals and some of the Contra arms deals. And the New York Times and Newsweek had used him as a major source. And so um, I went up to see Brennicky and I, I, I spent a week with him. Uh, and when I, when I got back, uh, I really didn't have much because Brennicky didn't have a lot of documents backing up what he was saying. It was a very frustrating experience with Brennicky. I mean, he's, he's a typical kind of intelligence agent that will, will deliberately lie to you on some occasions. I mean, you, you just can't trust everything he tells you. But on, on the other hand, he will tell you the truth on a number of cases. And he, at one point in, in our conversations, began describing a landing strip in far west Texas uh, that had been a CIA guns for drugs deal, uh, you know, guns and drugs transshipment point. And he said they flew C-130s in and out of there. There's a 4,000 foot. So I, I ripped a, a big sheet of paper out of my legal notebook and I said, draw me a map. You know, so he starts drawing this map and here was Lajitas, which is west of Big Ben. He's, you go, he said, about 10 miles northeast and there's this mesa. And he had a very detailed map. 4,000 feet, he gave me the the, uh, the way it was oriented, uh, the fact that there was a mountain just north of it, and there was a mesa there. And, and so I took that back to Houston with me, um, hoping, you know, I didn't, maybe this would check out. So I, I got a, uh, a USGS Class A topo map of the area, which I, I was absolutely positive would show a landing strip that big 4,000 feet. And I get the map out and I look at it, and I can see about where it should have been, according to his, his map, and there was nothing on the map. 
And so I said, well, I'll give it one more shot. I get the aerial photographs that they use to make these maps. They take aerial photographs. And so I ordered the aerial photographs, and I got them out, and I, and I looked at them, and there it was, right exactly where the landing strip, oh. exactly where he described it. And the FAA had no record of this. It wasn't on the, any map. And so I went out, out to that, to uh, it's about 15 miles northeast of Lajitas, and about, oh, I'd say less than 10 miles from Terlingua, and actually drove out to it and looked at it and began talking to people about it and basically got it confirmed that it was a uh, C-130s flew in there with arms and drugs. And, uh, and Brennicke had told me that when he flew in there, uh, that he asked the people he was flying in there with who were people, by the way, associated with the Medellin cartel, whose landing strip this was. He was told that it was, Wal they told him Walter Misher. Now, Misher owns, uh, at that time, it owned probably close to 300,000, maybe more acres in that area, but he didn't own that piece of property. He had land to the west of it and land to the south of it. So when I began researching who owned this property, I found a widow in Florida actually owned that property, and she had never been there in her life and only found out a, a few years before I talked to her that a landing strip was there because one of her relatives went hunting and told her, did you know there's a landing strip right in the middle of your property? And she said, no. And uh, she said it was done without her knowledge or permission. And of course, what a great, it was actually the only place in that area, that's a very rough, rugged country there. Uh, just west of Big Bend. It was the only level place for miles and miles around in that vicinity that you could put a landing strip. And of course, if, if a, a widow from Florida who's never been there owns it, um, and just about anybody wanted to probably could go. And of course, the law enforcement had to know about it. When you talk to them, you get contradictory answers and inconsistent answers, and, and they're trying to cover up, obviously. Uh, although they would acknowledge that they'd seen C-130s in the vicinity. Hmm. Well, there's no reason for C-1. Of course, there is a uh, low-level training route for C-130s out of San Antonio in that area. What a, what a perfect cover, of course, for flying in C-130s. Can we get up to a higher level of politics again? Uh, Mr. Clean, uh, Mr. Benson, Lloyd Benson, uh, he's connected with this in some way. Yeah, I ran into Benson in a number of places. Um, the first place I ran into Lloyd Benson was in Jefferson Savings, which was in the Rio Grande Valley, I believe in McAllen. Uh, Jefferson Savings had been started by Lloyd Benson and his brother and Benson's father back in the mid-50s. And they controlled it up until the mid-70s when they sold it to a man named Guillermo Hernandez Cartaya. Uh, Cartaya is one of, one of the really bad boys of the Western Hemisphere. I mean, he, he's a Cuban exile, fought in the Bay of Pigs, was a member of the infamous uh, 2506 Brigade, uh, had been involved in, in narcotics trafficking, money laundering, gun running, terrorist activities out of Florida with a company called World Finance. The IRS and the FBI had close to 200 people investigating World Finance in the mid-70s. and Alt was ready to pop Cartaya big when the CIA stopped them and came in and, and basically had the, the investigation dismantled. And uh, as a result, Cartaya was just convicted on income tax charges. At that very same time, he comes and buys Jefferson Savings from the Benson family, okay, and proceeds to loot it and run drug money through it. Uh, when the Justice Department came in to investigate Cartaya were brought in by the Texas regulators and, and Art Leiser, who was the chief SNL examiner for the state of Texas, brought in the feds. Um, the CIA came down and met with the prosecutor and asked him to back off Cartaya because of all the favors Cartaya had done for our government, including, it turns out, scamming about $30 million from a uh, United Arab Emirates bank uh, with the apparent permission of the CIA. Um, <laughs> And Cartaya, the, the, the Justice Department did not back off Cartaya on that deal. He was convicted, but his sentence was rolled into his IRS sentence. And I don't know how many years, he probably only did a couple of years in jail. The next year after that happened, uh, 
uh, Cartaya was again indicted along with his partner, Camilo Padreda, another Cuban exile in Miami. That indictment was stopped for some reason. Uh, the Justice Department said later it was flawed, but if it's flawed, <laughs> why did they draw it up? Uh, Camilo Padreda shows up 10 years later as a partner of Jeb Bush, the president's son in Miami. Now, um, when I found out about Cartaya and also Jefferson Saves the fact that Lloyd Benson had you know, owned part of that, I called up Benson's office to ask him about it. I got his press secretary, Jack DeVore, I asked him my questions, you know, what, what was Benson's role in this SNL, you know, what he owned, did he know Cartaya, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, DeVore said he'd get back to me that the senator was in some conference on the Canary Islands, which is off the coast of Africa. About an hour later, DeVore calls me back and said the senator never owned any stock in this SNL, doesn't know anything about it, never had anything to do with it. I said, are you sure about this? He said, yes, I satisfied myself. He doesn't recall owning anything. I said, well, that's funny. I got a document here from the SNL uh, department that shows he owned 16.7% of the original stock and continued to own it up into the 60s. And these, these signatures are notarized. He said, well, I'll get back to you. <laughs> 30 minutes later, I get a call from Lloyd Benson himself from the Canary Islands saying, oh, yes, he had owned stock in that, but he got out of it uh, in the mid six and, and bought in uh, Brazosport Savings, which later became Continental Savings, okay? And uh, then I asked him about Cartaya, so he knew, knew it. I said, what about the CIA interference? He assured me that hadn't happened because he would have known about it. Well, in fact, I got this story straight from the prosecutor that the CIA went to. And so either Benson lied to DeVore or DeVore lied to me. There's no other explanation for it. I mean, they, somebody lied. I mean, they told me a lie, that Benson had never been owned any stock in this SNL. And if I hadn't had that document, they would have gotten away with the lie. Now, uh, it's interesting to note that this SNL that, that Benson bought after he got out of uh, Jefferson uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. Now, when I asked DeVore about that, he said they, they didn't know that B.B. was financing Kelly, and so they had no knowledge, Carol Kelly, the guy that owned it, whether mob money, this was mob money or not. But in fact, it was. Well, didn't Benson also uh, later, in, uh, when he was running as vice president, didn't he put the kibosh on any... Uh, uh, investigation or statements in any of the debates about the SNLs? Isn't that part of your book, too? Yes. Well, in, you know, in 1988, um, the country knew we had an SNL problem. We didn't know the extent of it. Okay, the, the original estimates had been something like maybe 10 $15 million. Uh, the Republicans, of course, with Bush as the candidate, did not bring up the S. You know, but Bush's son, Neil, was right in the middle of Silverado Savings. Uh, which was about to be taken down. In fact, was taken down only a couple of weeks after the presidential election. Someone in Washington had called the regulators in Topeka, Kansas, that regulated Silverado, and told them not to shut Silverado down until after the presidential election. And that's, in fact, what happened. On the other side, Benson was the Democratic vice presidential nominee. He went to the Dukakis campaign people and told them not to bring up the SNL crisis. And so they didn't. The Democrats did not use that as an issue. And they could have pounded the Republicans over the head with it. Uh, or maybe won the election in perhaps, 1988. Perhaps. And of course, we had, you know, we had the Keating Five. Four of the Keating Five were Democrats. I mean, the Democratic Congress had just as much to answer for as the Republican administration. And so neither side wanted to bring it up. Of course, both sides were being paid off by, by people like Misher. I mean, they, they always cover their bets. The, the people like Misher, you know, they support both sides. So regardless of who wins, they've got an end. And George Bush and Lloyd Benson are part and parcel of this same small Houston businessman circle that Walter Misher is at the middle of, Joe Russo is part of, and a guy named Jim Bath, a CIA operative in Houston, uh, is good friends with George Bush and George Bush's son, George W. Bush and, and has done investments for Lloyd Benson and was in business with Lloyd Benson's son. And Bath, of course, ties in with Misher. He got loans from Misher's bank. Uh, 
And it's all a very tight little circle here. Uh, that, that I mean, Bush and Benson are, are two peas in a pod uh, as far as being controlled and, and dealing with and have friendship with the same people. And what about any other connections that Benson might have to the SNL crisis other than him owning this one uh, SNL for 20 years? Did he have investments in, uh, or connections with other SNLs who were involved in the crisis, or did he do things as a senator that might be involved in making sure there's no investigations, et cetera? Well, I'm not, I don't know if he ever directly intervened, but he certainly didn't push for it. And he was head of the Senate Finance Committee that could have done all sorts of investigations. He never did. I mean, in, in fact, he did his best to see that the SNL crisis was not brought up. Um, he had three savings and loans at one time. It all ended up in the hands of either the mafia or the CIA people. Uh, Jefferson Savings went to Cartaya. Uh, Continental Savings went to Carol Kelly, was financed completely by Herman K. Beebe, and Ben Franklin Savings later ended up in the hands of Walter Mischer. Now, th this in and of itself is absolutely incredible that SNLs or banks or any institution can be sold to mafia-controlled groups. How is this even possible? Well, it's possible because um, uh, the people in power either don't know or don't want to know that these are mafia people. I mean, we don't. You know, the Justice Department had not done the kind of investigation required. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board wasn't doing investigations, and the press was not reporting. Of course, everybody knew who Beebe was. From the Dallas Morning News wrote about Beebe and the Texas Renobank scandal, but seemed to forget about it, you know, 10 years later when they're back involved in SNLs. And no one, you know, raised, I mean, we've got Congress not doing anything, we've got the Justice Department not doing anything, we've got the press not doing anything. But the public is not going to find out, and, and nobody's going to know. And what does Benson say, that he didn't know that these were mafia right. connections, that uh, he just sold his interests and someone bought them and he didn't investigate? Well, I think he knew who he was selling to, but he, he could say, we didn't know the money was coming from the mafia. Well, that's, you know, that's the kind of ignorance we don't need if, it, if indeed he didn't know. I mean, it's, it's an ignorance that's almost criminal. I mean, if it's not, if it's not, he didn't do anything criminal by actually knowing and intending that it happened. His ignorance borders on recklessness. Pete, we have a lot of more questions for you, and we're out of time for this program. But uh, would you like to continue on and do a second program? We want to get into how you got this story and the incredible information that you got and then wove together and the problems you had in getting uh, stories uh, printed uh, and also getting the book published. Uh, we, would, you, would you stay here and do us sure. uh, the favor of that? Sure. Great. Thank you. That's the end of this Alternative Views. We frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 787 one three. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'd like to thank our crew for making our program possible. Brian Lynch was our director, assisted by Ashley Blake, Mary McDonald, Carrie McParlin, and Dina Craven. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 787 one three. Goodbye. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board that regulates savings and loans withdrew a very stringent cease and desist order against Sunrise and replaced it with a weak supervisory agreement. And a congressional study found that this move cost taxpayers possibly $100 million or more in keeping Sunrise open. Sunrise was then closed down a year later, a year and a half later, uh, at a cost to the federal taxpayers of $700 million.
and there was no Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation. It was just shut down. Uh, we find if you look at the major borrowers at Sunrise, you find mafia people, you find CIA people, and you find a Houston businessman named John Riddle, who he ties into a, the circle of Houston businessmen that George Bush comes from. And Riddle, at this time, was involved in the transshipment of arms to the Middle East. Now, the top number two official at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and Fairbanks was in this meeting with the Sunrise CEO when he was asking them to get the feds off his back. Her husband, Richard Fairbanks, was in charge at that time of the State Department's efforts to keep arms from Iran called Operation Staunch. He quit a year later and became the Washington lawyer and lobbyist for Iraq and worked with Iraq until Iraq <laughs> invaded Kuwait. Now, it's interesting also to note that the largest failed SNL in the country that did not have a Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation, Sunrise was number two largest. The largest was Hill Financial in Red Hill, Pennsylvania, that plays a big part in my book. And the number two borrower at Hill Financial was John Riddle's buddy, a Houston builder named Mike Atkinson, who at that time was transshipping arms to the Middle East. So you find a connecting thread here of arms to the Middle East and savings and loans. And, and Bush's office was directly involved in... Today, Alternative Views will interview Pete Bruton concerning his book, The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. Pete is a former Houston Post reporter who broke the story of the connections between the SNL scandal and the CIA, exposing how CIA assets would borrow money from the SNLs to finance off-the-book operations and then declare bankruptcy and leave U.S. taxpayers with the bill. Well, for the past five years, Pete has been tracking down who actually profited from the SNL scam, who the main players were, and how they skimmed off their money. Lo and behold, Pete discovered that the beneficiaries of the SNL scandals were friends of George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer. Well, obviously, this is an explosive story, and today we are going to explore the full ramifications of the SNL crisis with author Pete Bruton, who's now a law student here at the University of Texas. Pete, this is such an incredible story, one that is so complex, it seems to me almost one impossible to tell, but you do it so well in your book. Uh, before we get into the intricacies of it, I wonder if... So the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and, it, and it's the way that, of course, Oliver North, William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country, and many connections between the two. This SNL that, that Benson bought, after he got out of Jefferson, uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. A subject that has been ignored by the establishment media. Pete Bruton has written a book about it. <laughs> 
and we talk with him right now on Alternative Views. Keeping the sunrise, uh, sunrise saving open and it was lending money to John Riddle. It seems like such a, a complex thing, but it seems everywhere you look there are certain things going on. The CIA and the Mafia and uh, there were drugs that were being run back uh, into the United States. There were illegal arms being uh, procured and sent to uh, the Contras as well as to Iran. And Iraq as we now know. And Iraq. Uh, but all of these interests coincided. The Mafia the uh, now how did the mafia was the mafia just after money is that how and uh, and uh, perhaps the selling of drugs when they came back into the united states i think the mafia just found it as another you know trough they could feed at and i think they were in on it at the beginning when they saw they knew what deregulation was going to do and the fact that they they figured out a scheme and, and the head of this scheme was a new york mobster named mario renda mm -hmm. who went to jail for like less than three years. Uh, he was convicted in New York, Florida, and Kansas City. Uh, Renda would collect money from various institutions like pension funds and credit unions, bundle it up into $100,000 bundles so it was covered by federal deposit insurance, and then place it in savings and loans all across the country, billions of dollars. And once he got the money, the deposits into an SNL, he could basically control them. He, could, he had a hammer over their head if they didn't do with this money what he wanted to, he would just pull it out. And this was called linked financing. He would place the deposits and then tell the SNLs to loan the money, to lend the money to his buddies. They would then just rip it off, take it and, and, and rip it off. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different... If you can tell us uh, how George Bush himself was involved in this. His family was, but was he himself involved much? Bush's role was on many levels. First of all, as vice president during the Reagan-Bush years, he was the head of the Reagan-Bush deregulation efforts across the board, and that included savings and loans. And the deregulation of savings and loans that occurred primarily in 1982 with the uh, St. Germain Garn bill um, basically opened up savings and loans to the crooks. Uh, SNLs had traditionally just done home mortgage lending uh, to middle class Americans and they succeeded very well for 50 years. Uh, they had some problems then in the late 70s and early 80s with the inflation, so the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. Uh, Bush also, as vice president, either he or his top aides intervened in the federal regulation of the biggest failed savings loan in the country at that time, Sunrise Savings in Boynton Beach, Florida. The CEO of Sunrise went out to Bush's office when he was vice president, and the, the story varies. He tells one story one time and one story another. He either met with Bush, with Bush's top aides, included C. Boyd and Gray, who is the current White House counsel. Uh, and he asked them to get the federal regulators off his back. They were trying to stop Sunrise from basically throwing their assets away. And uh, one week after he met with these people, 